Hello, uh, welcome to Creativity with Don Allen Third Live. My name is Don, I am an XR creator, and today I'm gonna go over how we would do IK rigging from Cinema 4D and bringing that rigged animation data into both Lens Studio and into Spark AR. Right now we are simultaneously streaming onto Instagram and onto YouTube, but we have all sorts of cool benefits if you watch this on YouTube right now. I got my keystrokes in there, so you'll be able to see what hotkeys I'm pressing. We have a better audio situation. I got the green screen set up. So I just want to push a little bit to have you watch this on YouTube instead of Instagram. Um, and yeah, and so I'll just show you proof. So right now, we'll, we'll, we'll be going over what is IK rigging, what is inverse kinematics. I'll, I'll talk about what this is and why this is important for bringing characters to life in AR. Just to show you that this will work. Um, this character right here of me as an avatar, um, that data, it was just a test data, but you see it working very nicely inside of Spark, uh, sorry, right inside of Lens Studio. And that same data, I got it working very nicely inside of Spark AR. So that is just to say that this tutorial is for both these tools. If you're, if you're a Cinema 4D artist and you're trying to learn about rigging, more advanced rigging, um, I'll go about it with like a basics approach, but we'll get a little bit more advanced and we'll show you how to get that data from Lens Studio and then get Cinema 4D, Cinema 4D data into Spark AR. We'll do, we'll do all of them. So welcome to the stream. Hopefully I can see you join over here on YouTube. Oh, we got some folks on the YouTube. We got Dylan Locke. Good to see you, Dylan. Hello, welcome. And we have Excellence Adeguan uh, with eyeballs. So thank you for um, taking a look. Welcome, welcome, let's, uh, let's get started. So first off, IK. What am I talking about? What is IK? rigging. So the best way for me to explain this is through Cinema 4D. I'm going to just zoom into my character here. So rigging has to do with bones. What are the bones in a character that makes them come to life? So this is an avatar I worked on earlier today. I used a tool called Ready Player Me. It takes like a photograph of you, uses an AI tool to create a 3D model, um, and I rigged it with some other stuff. So anywho, we got this, we got this model here. And uh, Rigging is these bones. So when I grab, for example, the spine, I toggle down the spine, we go all the way to, let's say, maybe the, the left shoulder, I can rotate my arm around, right? So I can rotate my arm. We could, you know, choose to lock it on one axis by grabbing one of those rings, you know, we can tilt it, or we can move it on multiple axes by dragging within those rings. You see, I can just do these like little rotations with my wrist. I mean, I'm using my wrist and my mouse right now, but I'm rotating the shoulder. So there's really two types of rigging that are really common for animation and oftentimes they scare people away from doing character animation. So I want to kind of demystify it. So the first type of rigging is called, like the first type of like rigs for animation is called forward kinematic rigs. So that's an FK rig. And so what this would mean is let's say I wanted to animate my wrist or I guess my left hand. Let's say I wanted to change the position of my left hand. Well, right now, this rig is in forward kinematics. So that means if I really wanted to change the position of the hand, I would first have to change the position of the forearm and also the position of the left arm in general just to get the hand to move. Because if I just grab the left hand as it is and switch to my translation tools, if I try to move the hand right now, we are able to move it, but you see how this doesn't make sense. We're not moving our forearm, we're not moving the upper arm, it's just moving the hand. And this is what we should expect to see when we are trying to move the end of a rig that is set to forward kinematics, which stands for FK. Oh, uh, let me just encourage people to join me over on the live stream onto uh, YouTube. So I'll just say uh, streaming on YouTube right now. And for those of you that are streaming on, uh, that are here on YouTube, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we'll, we'll be going over how to get this. I want to go over the basics of IK rigging and then We'll show you how to get that data into Cinema or into Lens Studio and into Spark AR. So I'm just going to say streaming on YouTube now. Just posting that into the live feed on Instagram. Okay, there we go. Okay, so right now, let's say I wanted to move. I wanted to change the position of the hand. What I was just saying is, if I grab the left hand as it is and I try to move it, what's happening is it is moving the hand, but it's not, it doesn't look right because we're not moving the forearm and it's not moving the upper arm. So traditional animation didn't have this thing called inverse kinematics. 
So that meant if we wanted to change the position of a hand, we would have to first, you know, go up to the left arm and maybe I would need to rotate the arm down here. Then I would go to the left forearm and rotate that. And then I would go to the left hand. And now the hand has been, you know, it's in a new position. It was up here a moment ago. Now it's over here. Um, oh, thank you so much, Dylan. Yeah. It's good to be doing rigging as much as you can just to get familiar with these tools because the metaverse is, is right around the corner or it's kind of like it's, it's the, what's it called like the foundation of the metaverse is happening right now. Um, it's important to start learning these skills ahead of time before you get too far behind. So I'm happy to hear that you're learning some rigging. Okay, so this method is great when you want to maybe have a very specific pose and you want the elbow to be exactly here and you want the, you know, you know, this, so FK is great for that. But I want to have a situation where I can move just the hand and it just works. I wanted to move the hand and I would love if it would move the forearm and I would love if it also moved the upper arm when I wanted to move the hand so that I could just focus on animating the hand position and then that would be everything I needed. So how do you do that? Well, I'm excited to show you how to do that right now. First off, it's always a good idea to clear your animation keyframes so that it doesn't get locked. So now there's no keyframes, there's no animation data on our character. And now I'm gonna show you how we would do this. So I'm gonna bring up the bones. These are all the bones of the body. You see how everything connects together. We've got the hips. Hips connect to the spine. Spine connects to another spine. Spine connects to another spine. And then it connects to a neck and arms and all this kind of stuff. So what you wanna do is start off with what you want to start the IK rig from. In my case, I want to start it uh, from here. So I want this, I want the shoulder to be able to be influenced by the position of the hand. So I'm going to grab my left arm, then I'm going to grab the left forearm, and then I'm going to grab the left hand. I'm holding shift to grab all three of these. Now with all three of these um, selected, we can see that all three of those bones in the system are highlighted. If you're having trouble seeing it, I could set the body to transparent, but you can kind of see it. it's like a little bit of orange here. That's just telling you that we are selecting that part of the body. And then when we go to, in Cinema 4D, we go up to the character tag, tab, and then click on the create IK chain. This is creating an inverse kinematics chain. So I'm gonna click on it and you see something broke. And I wanted to show you this because this happened to me when I first tried to learn rigging. And it was very, you know, frustrating when you're trying to rig and all of a sudden the arm flips around and you're like, no, that's not what I want. So even if we try to change the position of the wrist, it's kind of working, like the elbow is bending in the right direction, but you see how the, that shoulder got flipped around. So I wanna show you a really easy trick to prevent this from happening when you are doing your first rigging or, you know, or just kind of getting more experience with your inverse kinematics rigging. So I'm gonna undo this, Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, Control Z, going back. Oh, it really messed things up. I might need to like manually rotate it back to where it was. There we go, about 180 degrees. There we go, okay. So our arm is back to where it was. And here's, here's the trick. You have to tell, before you run an inverse kinematics rig, you have to give your 3D model a little hint as to what direction you want the bones to bend. So what I do is I first kind of bend an arm into a, a more neutral spot. So I'm going to bend the shoulder down and roll it back on that uh, blue axis. Then I'm going to take the left forearm and rotate that forward. And then I'm going to take my left hand and also give that a little like rotation. And why I'm doing this is this is kind of telling the computer that that point is where I want something to bend from. Without knowing what direction it should bend, it's going to guess, and it usually guesses wrong, and it's usually going to break your rig. Now, if you, are, you know, if you want to be a person in the metaverse, you're going to need to learn about rigging, or you need to have, you know, hire friends that can do it, or do it yourself. There's a lot of great tutorials. This video is live on the YouTube right now. It's going to stay there on YouTube, so you can refer to this at a later point. If right now is not the best time to learn rigging, I'm recording it live. It's streaming to YouTube as we speak, and you can watch it later. Again, we got better audio. We have um, all, the, all the buttons I'm pressing are being uh, captured on screen. So you know, again, one, one more little push for the YouTube streaming that we're doing right now. Okay, so now that the arm is bent, we bent the arm into like a direction. Now let's do the same trick. We're gonna grab the left arm, then the left forearm, and then the left hand. And it's important 
to do that in order. Otherwise, the rig's gonna get confused. So I want it to start from there, then it's going to there, and it's going to there. And now we're gonna go to the same tool, character, and go to create IK chain. And notice how this time it didn't do that weird flippy thing. It kept the shoulder exactly as we wanted. And it gave us this new controller called the left hand goal. Now if we grab our left hand goal and switch to our moving tools, now all I have to do is move the hand and now look at that, we get free motion. I move the hand and now it's going to move the forearm. It's also going, I'm gonna give us a little bit more space here. Now when we move the hand, it's moving the forearm, it's moving the upper arm, it's giving us a nice shoulder rotation. This is gonna look a lot better in any kind of context for animation purposes, right? And we can rotate it, or we can move it in different dimensions. So here's moving, you know, moving it up in the Y axis. We can move it forward and back in the Z axis. And we can move it side to side in the X axis. And notice how we're getting all of that free motion. When I say free motion, what I'm referring to specifically is the fact that I get to move the hand here and I didn't have to spend time manually animating the forearm. I didn't have to spend time anim manually animating the upper arm. We could just be like, I need the hand here and I need it up maybe forward over there and cool. And then you can just be happy. Then you can also still go in in more detail and, and manually rotate things further once you're there. But just having that goal, it's called a goal. This, you see that green line? That's the goal line. And so I don't, I don't know why they call it a goal, but it kind of connects the start. Basically that goal, that green line that you're seeing right here is saying where does the inverse kinematics rig start? So in my case, it starts from the shoulder and then it ends at the hand. That's, that's why these two are like kind of inherently tied together now. They are part of the same space. So this is great. We have a single arm in inverse kinematics. And just to remind, you know, just to refresh your mind, Right now, the right arm is not in inverse kinematics. So that means if I try to grab the right hand and I try to push the right hand somewhere else, it's going to break because right now it doesn't, there's no goal. It doesn't know that there should be a unique relationship where the hand position should change the shoulder of the right arm. Only right now, just the, just the left, you know, left arm, yeah, left arm, forearm and hand have that relationship. That's why we can, you know, comfortably move this. That's why we can comfortably just grab the left hand and just, uh, oops, bad example. What am I trying to do? Left hand. Wait. Oh, sorry. Don't move the left hand. You want to move the goal. The goal is what's controlling the position and the rotation of the, of the bones there. Okay. Looks like you're hyping up a crowd as a DJ. Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. So if you ever wanted to be a virtual, if you ever wanted to do a virtual DJ set in Unreal Engine, you would need to do the same thing that I'm showing you here. Uh, if you wanted to like be an avatar controlling a real mixing board in real life, you're wearing a motion capture suit, um, you could do the same technique. You could tie the rotation of other objects to influence the position of the goal, which would allow you to, you know, create really cool secondary animations. Okay, so cool. This arm is rigged and let's just, let's rig the other arm in IK so that we can get that practice. Uh, we have the right shoulder, which would be this thing. Now it turns out I don't actually want to rotate the right shoulder because that's like your collarbone. I want to preserve that. I don't want to move that. What I want the motion to start from is that right arm because that's kind of where the shoulder should be bending from. So I'm going to grab my right arm, grab that right forearm, grab that right hand. And again, pop quiz, is it a safe time to do the inverse kinematics rig? I'll give you... 10 seconds to think about it. Is this a safe time to do an inverse kinematics rig on this arm, given what you saw what would happen on the left arm earlier? All right, maybe pause the video and then guess, and then in five seconds, unpause the video, and then I'll share the answer. All right, cool. Hope that you've unpaused, you had your guess. The answer is this would break. The reason why this would break, actually I'll just show you. Let's, let's show you the break. So I have my right arm, right forearm, right hand. We have the right order. But if we go up to the top here and we go to character and we click on um, create IK chain, it's going to do that same weird thing where it flipped the arm around and it breaks it. And it's also probably going to bend in the wrong direction. See that? Like now our elbow, our elbow is bending incorrectly. 
And that's because we did not give the, we didn't give our character a hint at to what direction we wanted the elbows and wrists to bend before we did that bending. So I'm just checking the other arms, doing okay. All right, so now that you know, now that you know that, we're going to go back. I'm going to flip my arm back around, 180 degrees, get it back to its home position. There you are. And yeah, it looks good. And now we're going to give it a hint. So my hint is I'm going to tell it like, okay, this is an arm, and I want an arm to have a little bit of a bend back there, and I want the forearm to bend a little bit more forward. I maybe want my wrist just give me a little hint, little hint that it should have a little bit of you know wrist bend this direction. And just by adding those little rotations to the same three joints in our arm is going to allow us to rig it properly or to do an inverse rig on it. So I'm going to grab my right arm, right forearm, right hand. I'm holding shift to grab those three. We go back to character and we go back to create IK chain, which stands for inverse kinematics chain. Oh, we got a couple of questions. Oh, uh, Dylan says, no, it's not. And excellence, Audubon also said it wasn't good yet. That's, they were right. They were referring to you want to make sure you want to give all your bones a little bit of a bend. You want to give them a little bit of a bend before you do that inverse kinematics or else they will always break. We got a question here on Instagram. It says, uh, this is from uh, Richard, Richard OA, OA Hua says, the weirdest, the best. Cool. I appreciate the feedback. All right. So now this arm is rigged and watch, you're like, oh, I'm going to move it, right? Actually, in this case, we have it selected. What, what I was trying to say is you want to make sure you're always moving the goal when you're animating an inverse rig. You want to move the goal. You don't want to move the hand. If we try to move the hand, it's going to break. So it's, it's just so tricky, right? Like you're like, oh, I, I have it in inverse kinematics. Why can't I just move my right hand? It's because inverse kinematics is tied to the goal. The goal position is what allows that relationship with the other bones in your characters. So if you're doing an avatar creation or any virtual human beings, Oh, if any of you know the character Little Michaela, a lot of her rig is built the same way that I'm showing you right here. Little Michaela's um, avatar uh, is set, you know, when they have when they need the character to hold on to a specific prop, it's a lot easier to do that if the character's arms are set to inverse kinematics, just like I'm showing you here. And so you can see that, you know, we can move the arm left and right, we can move the hand up and down, and we're getting all of that other free motion of like that forearm and the uh, Everything's bending properly. And that, that's the goal with this, is just to kind of alleviate that stress so that we can animate, you know, more freely. So cool, we got, hope you're feeling, hopefully you're feeling like okay, right? So we got two arms and they're both now rigged in inverse kinematics. La la la, la la la, la la la. What's also cool about this is Inverse kinematics works for everything, so if I grab the hips now and I try to move the hips back, look at that, the hands are going to stay in position. That's the power of doing inverse kinematics. If I wanted to get this free animation out of the arms, all I have to do now is move my hips, and because the arms are set to IK and they have a goal, we can now get all that free motion you know, out of it. Like, let's say I was like a superhero animation and I need them to levitate, I'd just be like, Phew. Right, and just like if I, if, I, if I need to do a hovering animation for some reason, I could just animate just the y-axis, and I'd get all of that free positional data coming off of the arms. I feel like Doctor Strange, Peter Parker. Come with me if you want to live. All right, I think you get the idea. Uh, hi, Don. Did you rig model yourself? Yes, <laughs> exactly that. Uh, and it also works in all directions. So you don't just have to move forward and back. We can move side to side. But before we get too carried away, I like to do a little test to make sure that this data is working. So we're going to grab our left hand goal and we're going to do some animation now. Actually, let me just reset everything. So I'm back to that, that neutral spot on the ground. All right, my feet are on the floor. Great. Okay, so now what we're going to do is just some very basic animation on both arms and just see if that data looks nicely in AR through both Snapchat's uh, uh, Lens Studio and Facebook slash Instagram's Spark AR. So let's create that animation in Cinema 4D here. So I'm gonna grab that left hand and I'm going to navigate to its transform controls. These are all the values that we can animate. The P stands for position, R stands for rotation, 
S stands for scale. Those are all great things to animate when you're coming up with uh, character rigs. Um, D Dylan Locke says, Little Michaela, top secret IK chain knowledge. <laughs> yes, it is. This is how they're doing it, verbatim. Um, their rigs are more complicated too because uh, if you want to add more physics to characters, you can do like an IK chain on like body fat and then run dynamics on just those chains that you can get parts of the body to move like muscle groups and stuff. That's way more advanced and takes more time than I'm going to be going into today. But just to get your idea of like, it's the same principles that we're showing here today. All right, so I'm going to grab this left hand and I got my position, scale, and rotation. All I really want to worry about is the position. Notice how as I move just the x-axis, you see just the values right here changing, right? Just the values in the x-axis are that row. Just the values in the y-axis are here. Just the values, oops, just the values in this axis are there. So I'm going to go to frame zero. I'm going to start off with the hand maybe down to my waist on the side. I'm going to grab my right or my left hand control and move it to my hip, hip holster. Where are you? Left hand, go ahead and move it there. Great, it's on my hip. And then I'm going to set a value for my X, Y, and Z position of my hand. Then I'm also going to go to the end of my animation. I'm just going to go to frame 90, keep it really small and simple. So it's going to go to 90 frames. I'm going to go to frame 90, and I'm going to also have the same value, X, Y, and Z. That way it starts and ends at the exact same spot so I can get a nice seamless loop. Now I'm going to go to frame 30, I'm going to turn on auto keyframe with that button here. Auto keyframe remembers what values change over time and it creates that animation for you. So now, just by moving it, now we can interpolate between frame 0 and frame 30. The value has changed in the X, Y, and Z coordinate. And then I could, uh, yeah, we can change everything. So I can even have it come forward and maybe I go over here at frame 48. Maybe I want the hand to go up a little bit. Now we have this triangular shape that the hand is going in. And we can maybe have the arm maybe go back. What we're doing is called rigging test. Um, at different studios I've worked at, this there's actually a job title for this. This job title is known as um, Character TD. It stands for Character, Character Technical Artist. Or <laughs> it's hard to say. Character Technical Director. Char TD is what they called it at DreamWorks. And essentially, it's like it's making sure that your rigs behave properly before you commit to making a story out of the motion. So I'm just doing a pretty slow lateral motion, really just trying to see what breaks, what doesn't break. And I'm actually very happy with the way that this is all bending and moving in IK. Uh, and then what's also cool is um, we can animate everything in between these. So we can uh, show a little bit more space on the timeline down here. Those orange bars are the keyframes. So that's the value at frame zero. That's the value at frame 20, value at frame 40, uh, what, 48, value at frame 67, and value at frame 90. And you can see that those are represented by these dots. These dots are those exact keyframes. What's cool is you can change the timing by uh, grabbing those keyframes and moving them. So now if I want the hand to move really fast, boom, we've got a fast motion, then it's slow, 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 and then a little bit faster, a little bit faster, then super fast, and it's slow. So these are your, this is how animation works, uh, and cool. So now we have a hand that has some inverse kinematics. Oh, we got a question from Dylan Locke, says, unrelated, but how much experience do you have in Expresso and Cinema 4D? I've recently been getting into it. I'll be honest, I have very little experience with Expresso. Um, I'm still scared of it. I mostly just find tutorials of very specific things in Expresso, and I'm copying and pasting their node tree to kind of get the effect I need. Okay, so we got this arm motion, and now I want to show you the ultimate hack. How do we get this data of a unique character, custom rigged in IK, custom animation, how do we get that out of here and into Lens Studio without breaking? Here's where you probably want to be on YouTube so you can see these little hotkeys. We're going to go to File, and then we're going to go to Export. Now, if you don't see it, sometimes this happens. Uh, you might have to change your layout. If you're in startup, sometimes you won't see your export options. It just says quit. <laughs> That's awful. So I like to go to set this from uh, to startup or standard, or just change the context until you get that menu to pop up again. So I'm going to choose startup, and now I can get my export options. 
I'm going to go to File, Export, and we're going to choose this format. This is called the GLTF slash GLV. This thing works so well in AR, I, I couldn't recommend it more. So let's go ahead and click on it. And here's what we want to change. Set your file format to GLTF. And um, we don't have any morphs here, but if you really don't want it to break, um, this, this character actually has facial animation, um, like pose morphs. Uh, I don't want to do that today, but essentially, I could like animate the character. I can do mouth open, mouth smile, uh, squint. So the base of, what, oh, let me hide the glasses so you can see a little bit better. Let me go to glasses, let me hide the glasses. So this character has a full on facial rig. So I can move the jaw, we can do mouth close or open. Um, oh crap, I have auto keyframe turned on, so it's actually changing, it's animating all those values. I need to undo that. Oops, let me go control Z a bunch of times so that we undo all that animation. Okay, and turn off auto keyframe. So what I was just trying to point out is that all of the character is rigged so I could like talk and stuff. And I'm just moving my mouse at the same speed of me talking. And that's how I'm creating this illusion of facial motion capture. But this actually can be rigged inside of Unreal Engine. You can rig a whole face. You can have a webcam like this driving the animation of a character in real time with Unreal Engine. Uh, we'll do a different tutorial on that at a later time. But for now, I don't want stuff to break, so I'm just going to delete all my morph targets so that we don't have the ability to do facial capture. It's just going to be um, body. In this case, I just want to see, does this arm move properly? And it will, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident with the way we set this up. Back to export, we'll go to File, Export. We're going to choose that GLTF option. And then under the file format, I'm going to switch it to GLTF. And I'm going to turn off my morphs. They don't have them. But, or you, I mean, now we, we deleted them, but you could also disable them by just hitting none. I'm gonna set this back to PLA. Did you say this model was made from free software with a photo of yourself? Yes, this model was made with a free software with a single photograph of my face, not even my body. The website is called readyplayer.me or readyplayer.me, one of those two, and um, yeah, you give it a you give it an avatar or you give it a photo and it generates an avatar with rigging. A lot of rig not it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's a great place to start. Um, so I'm gonna leave all the other parameters and hit OK. And then I'm just gonna save this into a new folder. We'll go to Deep Motion, IK tests. I'm gonna make a new folder in here and we can call this live live test. And we'll just save that. I'll call this the first one. Um, test underscore one in my live test and save it. it. Takes a second to export. Awesome, and now let's open up Lens Studio. So I actually already have it open up somewhere down near the bottom. Having trouble seeing the main screen, there it is. And I'm just gonna start off from, so this is the old one. I'll, I'll show you how we got here right now. So we're in Lens Studio. I'm gonna go to File and start a new project from Template. In this case, I want to start from the object, te object template known as the, wait, I don't see it. Uh, let me go to all, and then it's the one that's called animated object. I'm going to discard this one. I don't need it. It works. I'm just going to show you the principle right here live. Okay, so this is the animation template. It's free with Lens Studio, which is pretty sweet. And um, you got a little view, you know, 3D viewer here. Um, these are just like models that Snapchat made and places in here as um, you know, references. And what I'm going to do is import my model. So I'm going to go to that plus sign, click on import from files. We're going to navigate to my live test folder. I'm going to grab that test1.gltf and open that up. And we'll hit import. It takes a couple seconds to load and then you'll see all the texture data is coming in and you get this F. This F, I don't know what the F stands for, but I know that the P stands for prefab. You want to drag that prefab as a uh, in, underneath that world object controller and place it right under that um, FBX replace me button. I'm just going to drag it right on top of there. And immediately our character is in the scene. Now you're ha you might be having trouble seeing it and that's because it's um, this red panda is blocking it. So I'm going to go to that red panda and turn off its geometry. And now I can see me. And I'm going to scale me up. So I'm going to grab the prefab. That's my body right there. 
and I'm going to go to my transform controls inside of Lens Studio, which is this button here. And if we drag our cursor right on top, if we drag our cursor right on top of that blue um, cube, we can scale our body up. And now look at that. We have our inverse kinematic animation of our hand position. Uh, it is properly brought into Lens Studio. We can, you know, I can rotate my character around right here, but you see this is what it would look like in AR. And this would work in AR right now. If I publish this to Snapchat, we would have our animation, our custom character from Ready Player Me with our custom inverse kinematics rig. It would just work. We would, we, we would get this data and we'd have a filter. This is how I rigged the um, Tesla bot. I used this exact same technique to make my Tesla bot 3D model, rigged it, put it in Snapchat three hours after they announced it. So there you go. Now let's see, does this work? How do you do this in Spark AR? Uh, I'm gonna minimize Lens Studio. Um, I already have Spark AR open. I wanna start off from scratch. I'm gonna go to File, New from Template, and I'm gonna choose a new world object. Very similar templates. And it uh, looks like it didn't make a new one. Let's, oh, I, don't know what, what, I don't know what it did there. Let me, I'm just gonna close it all the way, discard that. Okay, so here we are inside of, I'm gonna minimize some stuff. So here we are inside of Spark AR. This is the, uh, the augmented reality, free, free augmented reality product by Facebook and Instagram. They have a template in here called the World Object Template. I'm gonna go ahead and click on it. Uh, these templates are great. I highly recommend you start from them. They just save you a lot of time. So this one just puts an object in your scene and it has some programming in it where you can like, you know, move your, your camera around. That'd be like if you're moving your phone around when you're in Instagram. And uh, enough of that. Let's just get our character in here. So up at the top, or no, up at the bottom, there's a button that says Add Asset. We're going to click on that and then just go to Import from Computer. And then I'm going to go to my live test. I'm going to grab that test1.gltf and hit Open. And it's going to take a second to load. You see that little feedback at the bottom there. And once it's done, you'll see it pop up in your Assets panel. And there it is. So I have my test1. Now it's a little different than uh, Lens Studio, and what we do here is it's similar, but also different. So instead of grabbing a prefab, what you want to do is just grab this whole folder that says test one in my case, and just drag it right onto the drag here. Now immediately it's going to place your character into the scene, and it's going to be on this ro you know, ro ro rotary thing. So we got to make some adjustments. First adjustment I'm going to make is the scale, because right now, you know, if I'm holding up my device, I'm going to be out of the frame, unless you want a giant. Like, if you're trying to make a giant from, like, uh, Attack on Titans or something, it's fine to have it be out of frame, because you expect that. But I want my body to fit in the phone right off the bat. So I'm going to go to that scale, and then hover over the cursor here, and then just scroll left and right on that cube to change my world scale. Now, the next thing you're probably going to notice is look at how shiny the shirt is. That's not what we gave it. So what's going on here? This used to be a very big problem for me. I didn't understand how you would fix that. And I'll just show you how friendly it is to fix right now. So to fix that reflective thing, we would go into our uh, test one, we expand it, and then we would look for the material that's responsible for that texture. So in this case, it's the top, it's my outfit top. If I click on that, we get the parameters that make up that texture for the, uh, for the model. And look at this value, metallic. For whatever reason, the metallic strength is set to 100%. So this thing is made out of 100% metal. We can fix this by reducing it to zero. But we're still getting that glossiness. It almost looks like a, a plastic now instead of metal. So then how do you fix that? Well, we turn up the roughness. Roughness is like letting the light hit the object and then scatter versus um, light hitting and then reflecting at the same angle. And so with those two fixes, you know, reducing metallic, increasing the roughness, we now have pretty much the same asset into uh, Spark VR. Last thing you're noticing is we got that weird rotation happening and that's not what we animated in Cinema 4D. So here's the fix for that. We go to our looping anim playback block and turn off spinning. Boom, so no more spinning. And uh, also I wanna delete this, um, whatever reference object this thing is, this, uh, it's a plutonic shape. I don't know what plutonic it is, but I'm going to delete it. So I just grab the plutonic and just hit delete. And so we're almost done. Last thing is, how do we get our animation? We, we animated our arm. How do we get our arm to animate in Spark VR? 
This part's a little weird, so bear with me. What you're gonna do is grab your character, so grab and test one, and uh, up in the top right corner, there should be a tab that says animation. And what you wanna do in Spark AR is turn on the controller and say create a new animation controller. And you have one more step after that, so cool, we have an animation controller. Now we go back to our object, we expand it out, and, uh, sorry, take it back. We look at our assets, and there should be a little playback controller in here now that's called Animation Playback Controller. You can rename it, um, but I'm just gonna leave it for now. And then we just double click on it, and what you wanna do is change the anima animation clip from None and set it to Item. And now we have our animation from Cinema 4D brought into um, Spark AR. It's that friendly. So there you have it, folks. That is how you would go about getting your, uh, let me bring up that thumbnail again. That's how you would go from Cinema 4D. Let me go full screen here. That's how you go from Cinema 4D and set up an inverse kinematic rig and bring that data into both Lens Studio. Oh, we got a power outage there. I'll repeat that. So there you have it, folks. That is how, oh, my green screen's all messed up here. What's going on with the green screen? Let me fix that. Video capture device. Green screen, filter, chroma key, crank up that similarity percent, opacity, is that it? Okay, whatever, the green screen's fine. Um, so that's how you would go through Cinema 4D, creating an IK rig, and then that's how you take that data into Lens Studio um, for Snapchat filters and lenses, and that's how you bring that same data into Spark AR for Instagram filters, Facebook filters um, on, on, the, on there. So hopefully this was super helpful. Um, you're welcome to end the video now uh, if you're happy with that basics knowledge. But if you want a little bit more advanced knowledge of this kind of rigging, stick with me. Right now we are live streaming to YouTube. So hello everyone. I just want to say a big shout out to Dylan Locke. I see Matthew Convento. I see Rama Vyas. And I see Excellence Adwan up here on uh, YouTube. So thank you so much for being with me. Um, I'm going to continue to show you a little bit more advanced rigging technique uh, if you're here for it, but I wanted to kind of just get away, get, get across that main element of like how do you just do this. And again, IK rigging stands for inverse kinematics. So let's do some more advanced stuff now that I got your attention here. So we're going to do another, we're going to do another, another, another cool thing. So let's do inverse kinematics on the legs. So I'm going to toggle down all my bones in Cinema 4D. These are all the bones. That's my left leg, left foot, left toe base. I actually decided to turn off the toe um, because it was causing problems with how I captured. Uh, the motion capture was done with AI using a different tool called Deep Motion. Um, but yeah, so I, I actually deleted the, the ability for the toe to act, the toe bone to actually influence the toe geometry. Instead, the left foot, uh, sorry, instead the left leg controls the foot as well. So my character can't actually bend its ankles. So that's fine. I, just for the principles of teaching this, uh, it's not needed. Oh, um, Matthew Convento says, don't forget to save your work, bud. Oh, thanks. I will save right now. And we'll save it into the IK test for the live testing, and I'll just save that there. All right, so let's do some more advanced stuff. Um, let's, let's, let's set this left leg into inverse kinematics. Again, the same rules apply. You wanna give your 3D model a hint at, as to what direction things should bend. So I'm gonna bend, I'll, I'll take both my right leg and my, I'll take both legs and bend them forward a little bit. Then I'm gonna take the left leg uh, just beneath the kneecap and rotate that down a little bit. Awesome. Um, you don't have to be this dramatic with the amount of bending, so I'm actually changing my mind already. I'm going to make it a little bit less dramatic, but still telling it a good indicator of what direction I want the bones to, uh, what direction I want the bones of the legs to bend in. So give them a little bit of you know bend towards the knees. Now we're going to go to the left leg and then grab all the way down to the left foot, and with those all selected, we go to character and set uh, create IK chain stands for inverse kinematics chain. We got a question from uh, Jorik.Rosa on Instagram. It says, how to bake a few animations into one FBX? Oh, um, 
uh, that, that, all, that's, someone, that's an area that I still screw up with a lot. I only know how to do it through trial and error. So I'll probably refrain from using that right now. But in Cinema 4D, it's called Takes. So I would say a good thing to maybe look up on YouTube would be um, Takes Manager in Cinema 4D with .fbx files. That's exactly what I would look up right now to, to find out how to do that. But I don't know how to do it off the top of my head. Um, so with those three bones selected in that order, we're going to click on Create IK Chain. There we have it. Look at that. We've got a new, goal, a new goal. This one's called the Left Foot Goal. I'm going to set it to Transform. And now we can... We can move our we can move our legs, and uh, we can do some cool kicks like kick ka, whoop ka, ka. Yeah, it's important to make the sounds. Oh, broke it. There we go. Okay, having some fun. So the good that leg's done. Let's do the same thing to the right leg. I'm gonna grab that right upper leg. Uh, left leg left, and right foot or whatever, all the right stuff. This is all the legs that I'm grabbing. And then I'm going to go to that, uh, oh, oh yeah, it's bent nicely, cool. So then we'll go to character and go to create IK chain. Same idea, we now have a right foot goal. So now we can move our right foot and uh, great. So here's the really exciting thing. Now that we have all of these goals, set up for our character. I'm going to delete the uh, animation on the hand real quick by just grabbing those keyframes and deleting them. So I get this like uh, basically setting it back up into its original position. So now that we have our, um, our, our, our body of our character with each limb set to inverse kinematics, we can now do some pretty silly uh, but fun things, silly, fun, weird things with our character. We can now grab something like the hips and just move one parameter like the hips and we're getting all of the motion of the arms and the legs. That's, that's really cool. And this works in all directions. We can go forward and back. And you see how I could just spend time just animating the hips and we're gonna get all of that free motion out of the rest of the body. And it works side, you know, side to side. And so, yeah, that's, this is a little bit more advanced, but you know, now that the characters, now you'd be like, I believe I can fly. <laughs> and then he lands back there and then, you know, could, you know have him do a dance. Um, a lot of the dance moves in Fortnite are done this way. Initially, they use a little mixture of motion capture, but a lot of it is hand animation when they set the character into IK. Or they'll, what they'll do is they'll set, like for example, let's say there's a dance move on Fortnite that's mostly the upper body. What the animators do for Epic Games is they will um, they'll set the legs of the character into IK, but they'll keep the arms in motion capture. That way the legs will stay fixed and will kind of bend nicely with the hips without having to um, rig everything. It's ri or I guess everything is rigged without having to hand animate everything. It can save them a lot of time when they animate the dance moves in Fortnite. And you can also rotate things. So I can now rotate, you know, I can rotate just the hips and we get all that other motion out of the body. It's, you know, very effective. So I'm going to raise my, you know, body up to about ground level there. And then now we can just rotate the hips and we get this nice little extra animation. You see how the legs are also, you know, the knees get a little rotation. The arms do that little thing. It looks like I'm doing the robot. So let's make some animation now. And also this works with the other body parts. Look at the spine. If I just up, you know, if I just animate the upper part, like Mr. Roboto, you get the idea. So now that the character is fully rigged, oh, we got some comments up on YouTube. Let me answer some of them. Uh, we got Matthew says, don't forget to save. Uh, oh, uh, Rama says, is the, is the concept for IK rigging the same as Cinema 4D for, uh, for different 3D softwares too? Yes, I'm excited to say it is. Um, they use different words for things, except I, IK and FK are universal. That's what's used in Maya. That's what's also used in Blender. Oh, and actually it's used in Houdini too. Okay, yeah, so yeah, the principle's the same actually. Because it turns out like rigging like this is actually a pretty old technique in the 3D animation world. So a lot of them, even in different programs, they're going to use a lot of that same language. Sorry, I'm just having some fun here. Okay, so there you have it. 
And you can also do cool things like that aren't symmetrical. So I could take, for example, the right foot goal and translate its position up here and maybe push it that way so it's like standing on something and maybe even rotate the leg out. And we can still move the hips separately and we're going to still get all of that free motion where it's like as if we're like standing on some kind of surface. Um, it's, it's really powerful to have a character in IK and it can be a very fun process when it works, which it is now. Right now it's working, it's working exactly as I had hoped. And you don't have to just be limited to inverse kinematics animation. We can, you know, right now I'm just bouncing my mouse up and down and we could animate that position and you would get this exact motion in both of those AR programs. But we can also do, yeah, the moves are pretty funny. <laughs> um, it's fun. And you can also rotate things. The one thing that you can't really do, 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 <laughs> the one thing you can't really do is scale. If you start scaling your rig, it will break it like that. And I see this a lot. So as soon as you touch the scale parameter, your rig is destroyed. Um, so that's the one caveat with this technique. Inverse kinematics is, a, is really about position and rotational data only. You can change position, you can change rotation, but if you touch scale, you will have Slender Man in shambles. You don't want that. Unless you do. Maybe you're trying to scare people. Um, in which case, it's great. It's all about your, your intention, your goal. But so far, everything I was doing was just, you know, rotations work really well and translations. And you can merge the two to get some really beautiful character animations. So, um, yeah, there you have it. Uh, we've got some, uh, Dylan Locke says, scaling the rig looks hilarious. It is hilarious. I'll do it again. Hoopla! Look at that neck. Oh my God, my eyeballs. My eyes shot out of my head. I look like an alien. Whoa. Whoa. What is, what's going on there? Oh man, yikes. But again, you now understand why this happened. It's because we touch scale, but we, you know, we want to work only with rotation. I mean, unless you want to break the rig, I'm fine with that. If, if you're down to break the rig and it's part of your storytelling, then by all means. Sorry, I'm just having some fun. So it's pretty much done. Uh, I'm just gonna make some silly animation now with the fully rigged character. And yeah, we'll bring it back into Spark AR and we'll bring it into Lens Studio. But I think all the core principles that I'm trying to show are done. Now I'm just gonna have some fun animating because we did it. We did, we got our character. We have our four goals. You can also grab goals together and you can move them together. You know, so if I, if I wanted to like have the character jump off of something like in the matrix, like run on a wall, like um, you could grab both. You can you can grab both goals at the same time. This also works for the right hand and the left hand. We can grab both the goals together, and we can animate them to work together. If I you know, I'm very Italian, as in I'm half Italian. I do speak a lot with my hands, so this would make a lot of sense for me to use this feature since I talk a lot with my hands. I would want to use both the hand goals and grab those two together and do my dialogue this way. And you can also grab things that don't even make sense. I can grab a hand and a foot at the same time and then move these together. So this is the power of inverse kinematics. I mean, this kind of animation would take a lot longer if we had to manually rotate and change the position of each bone in order. Just so that you get some appreciation, if any of you watched the very first Lord of the Rings uh, movie, when they had, that, when they had all the orcs uh, storming like that land, like that, like that meadow looking thing, they didn't have inverse, inverse kinematics yet. So all that animation had to be done so manually. Every bone had to be rotated. Ugh, I can't even imagine. I mean, they didn't know, they didn't have a better option at the time. Inverse kinematics came after Lord of the Rings made their movie. Hello, Vardon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are live streaming to YouTube right now. This one was all about rigging specifically getting your IK rigs from uh, Cinema 4D. <laughs> what is this motion? Yeah, stop, stop, back up. I should make a fighting video game.
Use windmill. Um, DA3, use windmill. Use hip glide. It's fun. I'm just having fun now. Uh, we got some questions in the comments. Dylan says, scaling the rig looks hilarious. Matthew Convento says, I'm surprised that it's not breaking and dancing. Ha ha ha, the eyes. Technically, you can do fun art pieces there. IK Chains make animations less intimidating. It does. That was my whole goal. I wanted to make animation less intimidating because now all we have to animate is the hips. I animate the hips and I get all this free motion out of the hands and arms and legs. You know, and now you could like, you can get all weird with it. Like, for example, let's say I'm in the circus and I'm in one of those rings. I'm, a, I'm one of those circus ring people. I'm going to bring in a ring here and then I'm going to rotate that ring uh, 80, uh, 90 degrees and uh, I'm going to place the ring around me, make, the, make it a little bit thinner. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my left hand goal and, you know, stitch it to that part of the ring. And then I'm going to grab my right hand goal and stitch that to, not even stitch, it's just placing. We're just moving the position of it. Um, in 3D, we call position movement translation. You translate positions. I don't, I don't know how you feel about the naming, but that's what it's called in 3D. You know, in almost every 3D program, it's called translating. Um, you see how there's certain spots, though, that it can't go? Like, I can't put my arm right here because it's, it's kind of tricking it. You can change the angle of the goal. That's more advanced, but you can do it. So you can make two goals. One could be the direction at the elbow points, and the other one is the vector that connects the start and end position. I don't want to go into that today, but I just want to show you that that's an option. I'm going to put the arm in a little bit more comfortable spot, maybe right, right around here. And I'll do the same with the uh, left hand so that we're not breaking the um, shoulders. And then I'll move my hips back so that, we can, uh, so that it doesn't break as easily. Then I'm going to grab my left foot bend the knee, which is, you know, as friendly as just moving the foot position. There we go. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll push it a lot, up a little bit more to the side. And then I'll grab my right, right, wait, right foot and do the same thing. Because it's almost like modeling too. Like you could do like 3D modeling to some degree, right, in, in, in this form. Now I'm going to grab my torus, this ring shape, and I'm going to bring that pipe radius down and uh, yeah let's do that and now take a look at this I can just move the hips and now I'm like staying on the ring so I could be looks like I'm uh, a, an avatar stripper now wasn't the goal but it looks like that I feel like little Nas X in Montero right now Just having fun. Uh, Dylan Locke says the IK chain dance needs to exist. That would be sweet. Let's see. I'm going to try to put the heel of my foot a little bit more firmly onto the base of the torus. I'm going to grab the torus, raise it up, meet the torus at the feet location. There we go. And then I'll move the, what, the right foot? No. Yes, right foot. Let's get that right onto the edge of the torus. A torus is this shape that I'm standing on, this ring. And then let's get the hands. Let's get the hands. Where's the hands? Right hand goal. Let's bring that up. Shablam. Oh, fun fact. Right now I have a, 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 a feature on here called limiter, which means it's going, it won't stretch a bone further than it can actually move. But if you're doing like a more stylized character, they have an option with every single inverse kinematics you can make it stretch to auto fit any distance. So right now that's the right hand. So if I go to my right hand thing, oh, got a battery reset there. So we can go to my right hand and change it from, uh, it says pull vector. Oh, there it is, squash and stretch. If I turn on squash and stretch, I can now make my arm any distance and it will now stretch my rig to fit anything. Um, and you can dial it down like I can make it so that the squash is the same But now like my arm can stretch a little bit further Isn't that cool? So if you need it to be like um, 
What character from Marvel can stretch their body? I know it's the Fantastic Fantastic Four, but I don't know the name of it. Or or uh, Mrs. Incredible, Mrs. Miss Incredible, Mrs. Incredible, um, from Disney. They use this technique to have her do this, a lot of the stretching stuff. They essentially made it so that she's allowed to break the rig's bones. And you see what it's doing is it's scaling the bone. Um, the, the one caveat, though, with this technique is as you stretch the bone further and further, the texture is getting stretched. So for when they did um, when they did the Incredibles and they had her, let me hide the bones for a second. Let me go to display options, filter, let me hide all the joint chains, joints, 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 joints. There we go. So you see how the texture is stretching here? If you have this effect and you want your character to have the ability to stretch their body parts, um, you have to add a lot more texture resolution in that area. Otherwise, when the polygons stretch, it's like there's not resolution there. There's no paint, so it can't actually fill in what's not there. But yeah, now I am that stretch character. Remember the game Street Fighter 2? The guy who can stretch really far? He's like... That's me right now. But right now, only this arm is set to that. And this arm is not set to that. The left hand is limited. I can't go past what it, you know, it's limited. So it's just, just showing different ways of working with rigs in Cinema 4D. And these are also true across the other 3D programs. I don't think the stretching parameter is going to work very nicely, though, inside of like uh, Spark AR and Lens Studio, because I think the way that it, in, I think the way that Cinema 4D thinks of that data is unique to Cinema 4D, meaning you try to bring that somewhere else and it's going to really break your rig. All right, so I'm going to try to get the hands there and then I'll grab my left hand goal uh, and, and maybe bring this closer in and bring that up a little bit, bring that back and then bring that hand down. Cool. And now I'll grab my hips and move my hips forward. Actually, I need to move my hands forward. Let me grab my right and left hand, connect them as much as I can right around here and then we'll have our hips meet in the middle. Awesome. And then um, I'll move my hands up. Everybody's hands goes up and they stay there with the IK rigs. They stay there, up, down, up, down, up, down. And just go ahead and just put the hands there. Okay, so now we can have a really uh, interesting animation of just animating the hips and the arms and legs for the most part, are going to stay put. I guess I have to kind of stay. <laughs> this is really silly. <laughs> I'm having fun. Elastic Girl. Thank you. That was the character name, Elastic Girl. So now, yeah, now the characters. The other thing you're probably noticing is how do you get the hands to like orient better? What's cool about this technique is I left the hands out of IK so that I actually have the ability to hand to hand pose the hand. I can go to um, the right hand itself and rotate it very deliberately. Like I could rotate the wrist around here. Then I can grab all of my thumb and index fingers and roll those fingers down and make like a grip. You know, I could have the character grip is what I'm saying. You know, I can grab each index. It's just, it just takes more time, but you can grab with the rigs. You can, you know, you can, you can bend the fingers manually around uh, an object and then so I'm, just, I'm bending my fingers now. See, it's just tedious, though. I was trying to do it really quickly, but this is important, I guess. So I wanted to show you uh, bending, bending the fingers. Uh, and let's grab the pinky. The pinky died somehow. I don't know what's going on there. It looks like it flipped. It flipped. I'm going to leave the pinky looking, looking skinny. Look at that skinny pinky. All right, let's grab that right hand goal. And now you can move that hand in that gripped position which is really cool, right? Because now we get the flexibility to do a forward kinematic pose with the fingers, but we're using inverse kinematics for the position of the hand. That's, this, is the, this is how you use best of both worlds, because now we can have a unique pose by our character um, you know, with the fingers, because the fingers are in forward kinematic, meaning, I mean, if you wanted to be really wild with it, you could set each individual fingertip to inverse kinematics and then you would just grab the fingertip and then you could move it and it would move all the other fingers but for a lot of the animators that I know they don't really like to set the fingers in IK because hand poses are such a good way of communicating 
And it's hard to be specific in IK with um, finger poses. But now that that hand is there, we can go to my hip controller, and now the hand is going to basically, be, you know, is going to be gripping. It's going to be gripping the top of the of the pole here, as my character shakes its booty, um, you know, left and right. That's hilarious. I wonder if this will get flagged. Yeah, it's worth a try. Maybe we'll publish it and just see what happens. It'll be really funny. So let's uh, let's do that to the other hand as well. I'm going to have it grip ish grip around. So we're going to grab the right hand. No, left hand. It's the left hand now. And I'm just going to start off with the left hand and we're going to rotate that wrist inwards. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to grab uh, the, what is this, left hand thumb. Oh, that's cool. I can have the thumb come down. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, let's have the thumb. Let's actually have the thumb bend around like it would. And then let's grab that thumb, thumb two. There we go. So we can grip around. I'll need to move the hand position again, but that's okay. And then we'll grab the left index finger, rotate that down. Grab the left middle finger, rotate that down. R uh, ring finger, rotate that down. Pinky, I don't know. Right, my pinkies are destroyed. I don't, I don't want to fix that because it's going to involve a process called weight painting. It's a fun process. It's just tedious. It's a lot of steps. I don't, I don't want to, I don't think people are going to notice the pinky that much. So I'm not, I'm not touching it. I'm not trying to ruin my day here. Just going through each bone, rotating it, fitting it nicely to our thingy. And then I'll move that hand goal in IK to get it to align better with the, oh, look at the thumb. <laughs> The thumb is broken. Oh my goodness. I'm like, <laughs> actually, wait, maybe that's not that broken. No, it is broken. What am I talking about? Let's get that thumb to not be so shattered. It's a sad thumb. That would hurt so bad. Let's get that thumb out of there. <laughs> there we go. That's a lot better. And then we'll just rotate the second thumb down a bit more. There we go. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of it. And then we can grab that hand all together and place it. Uh, it looks like the pole is still a little on that thick side. A little hard to grab. So I'm going to go to the pipe radius and just reduce the radius. Just cheat it. Cheat the radius. Oh, getting the message real quick. Let me make sure. Right. Oh, wow. It's in my set right now. Okay. All right. So we got, you know, this is so we got a lot more advanced, you know, we, um, but you get the idea. So now we could move just the, um, you know, I could I can move my hips left and right. I could also rotate it left and right. And you see how the hand tries its best to stay put. We don't get that much flexibility because you see that the elbows are going to start to turn at a certain point. But you know, now we could you know just focus on uh, animating a little silly performance. And, uh, oh, you know what we could do? We can have the whole ring spinning. Yeah, we can have the ring spinning, and then I can have my character shifting their body left and right to rotate the ring. I think, like, I've seen, I've seen gymnasts do it. Let me, I don't know what it's called. I might need a Google reference footage. Um, what do you, what would you say? Like, people that move around in a ring circus thing. Yeah, that will find it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, let me turn off the music for copyright reasons. So you, this is what I was imagining. So it's basically a torus that they have. And what they do is they, they grab the pole and then they shift their center gravity to get a spin. Yeah, so maybe I could do something like this. So I can have the character in a pose and then we're really just rotating the torus. And it will look a lot more intricate because, like, the character will have little subtle movements of the body weight shifting um, in the in that ring shape. I'm not a gymnast, but oh, that's cool! Having the two legs um, detached and the two arms connected—that's actually a kind of cool technique for um, the character. So yeah, 
that's kind of, I mean, I'm not going to go that ham with the animation right now. I was going to go very basic, like, let's just start off with just hips. So I'm going to start off in frame zero, grab my hips controller, turn on auto key, and I'm going to start off with uh, making the hips go to the left. And then we'll, let's say, maybe it'll take about 10 frames to get the hips to go to the right. And then I want to ease into that motion, so I'm going to switch to our animation profile, go to our F curves. These are the motion curves, that's the acceleration and deceleration from pose to pose. I'm going to grab this and just make it a lot sharper. So that we get that, like, ease in, boom, boom. And then let's hold it there for a little bit, and then let's return back to there. Oh, it's a little too sharp. It's Let's uh, maybe have that uh, happen a little bit later. All right, so we're going to get boom and boom. It's a little bit too fast. I'm going to grab all those keys and space them out from each other uniformly. Cool. Um, I'll add just a little bit more, uh, maybe a little bit of downward motion or upward motion there. Boom. And boom. Okay. Great. So we got that first bit done. Now what we do is um, I set a null object and I parent everything to that null object. The torus included. And so now what we can do with that parenting relationship is now we can rotate just the torus. Oh, weird. I put the null object in the center there. I might need to um, might need to think about this way where the rotation go. Okay, I guess we need to rotate from the center. So I'm going to move the rotational axis of the ring to the center here. And then now when I lean uh, left, I'm going to have my ring rotate that way on the torus. It uh, looks like that was a 90 degree turn. Oh, no. Oh, no, the torus stays the same. We're just rotating the null object. So that was a 24 degree turn. Uh, it's a little, I don't know, 24 degrees. Let's go ahead and set a keyframe. And then when I lean that way, we'll have the ring start to rotate the other direction. And we'll have it keep rotating that way for a little bit. And then we'll have it rotate back to its root rotation at the end. So now we get this. Cool. And I'll grab all those keyframes and then smooth it all out. Oh, I'll do it right one at a time. Let's grab just the rotation and then just smooth that out because that's a it's not a very smooth rotation. Weird acceleration there. Or actually, you know what it needs to be? It's just these two keys here. To the top of an arc. And then we could set the loop to be around uh, frame 64. And so I can just set that to loop at 64 frames. And now we got this pretty complicated looking animation um, rather quickly. And now I'm a gymnast. And then we could add more you know, complexity to it just by adding some head rotations and some foot um, sliding. And we can also add a little bit of a swivel, or you know what we could do? We can even grab the whole null object itself and have the whole thing rotate on the y-axis. And then we'll have, that'll look cool. So I'm gonna set a value, start at zero degrees, and at the end of 64 frames, we want it to be at a full 360 degree turn. And I set that keyframe. And so now we got this kind of motion. Pretty sweet. I've actually never seen this. Oh, oh, that type of um, acrobatic, or I don't know what it's called. Um, I want the speed of the rotation on the y-axis to be constant. And a constant rotation is not a curve. It is a line. I guess that's still a curve. It's, a, it's flat, is what I mean. So I'm going to grab the rotation on the, was it the h or the b-axis? What is it? H. So we're going to grab the rotation on the H axis axis here 
and see how it's um, a curve? That's why the, the spinning uh, accelerates and slows down. But if I want the rotating ring to be at a constant speed, we have to set it to linear. That way, the speed of the ring rotating is going to be constant. Sweet. Okay, okay. Next, I'm going to go to, um, I don't know, let's go to the, the head rotation. I think that would be kind of cool to animate. So I'm going to go toggle to my spine, maybe. And we can maybe add a little bit of a twist in here. Ooh, that doesn't look comfortable. Maybe we could twist back. And those don't look good. How about, how about we go to our head position and rotate the head left and right and stuff. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm looking this way. And then by the end, I'm looking, or maybe halfway through, I'm looking the other way. So grab the head position, set some values on its rotation. Make sure it ends in that same position so we get a nice seamless loop. And then in between is where we change it. So maybe at about halfway, maybe the I look like up and around the other direction. Set some values there. And now we got a head rotation added to the motion. And since like essentially every time we add a little bit more animation to the character, the quality of it just kind of goes up incrementally. But eventually if you add enough of them, you know, the customer, the client, the, the person receiving your effect is just going to be very happy with their experience. So just adding a little bit of ambient motion, uh, motion, motion, ambient motion is great. I'm going to go to the spine here. Maybe let's just do some lateral movement on the spine. Oh, actually, that's, that looks like a bone break. Don't do that. Uh, how about we do left foot or maybe, oh, we can have the feet swing off and stuff. So we got the right foot. Right foot, left foot, they could like jump up. <laughs> like the guy was doing, he was like, Whoa. Oh, that's cool. Seems like I would be spinning a little too slow to do that. So maybe, let's maybe put the feet higher or something. Oh, but the hips are locked because the hips don't lie. Oh, you can't move the hips. Okay. Feels like I'm in the matrix. Oh, I should put like a, a weapon in my other hand. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the feet swing from left to right um, to kind of help create the momentum that would make sense to, to stay upright the whole time. Like use of the ambient motion. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, ambient motion is really important. Uh, Matthew Conventa says, did you forget to eat? No, I had one meal today. So I did not forget to eat. But you're right, I should, I'll probably order something late tonight. <laughs> I'm a little hungry. All right, so I'm going to have the feet maybe, let's see, maybe they'll, they'll have both the feet. So this is left, this is left foot and right foot goal. So maybe I'll just have them swing like that and that to kind of get the momentum right. All right, so let's start with the left foot and let's set a value on its uh, rotation. Oh no, not rotation. What am I talking about? Position. We want to animate position because it's an IK. And then make sure it ends in the same frame so we get a nice seamless loop on that uh, leg. And then when it's over here, let's by this point, let's have the leg which leg is this? I guess we'll have the weight shift up. Does that work? Let's see. That kind of works. I'll make the motion, I'll make it spin faster. Or maybe I'll even, I'll make the ring tilt perhaps because it, it seems like it could benefit from a tilt at this point. All right, that leg looks like it's fine. Um, let's go to the right, oh wait, the right foot leg thing and then kind of mirror whoa kind of mirror what its goal is doing and then okay so let's set the right foot goal position there and then make sure that we go to the frame 64 set our keyframes there and then go to the mid frame and we'll just kind of you know maybe orient the foot forward to kind of give us some nice angular momentum 
pick up that weight. Cool. All right, so we have like two keyframes within those legs, and that's not enough for me. So I'm going to grab my right foot and my left foot now, and just the right and left, there they are. We can now add more keyframes to add more ambient motion. So I'm going to grab all their midpoints and add a little baby curve to them so that all the legs now have circular motions, which is a lot more natural if you're spinning. Like almost like riding a bike. Sweet. It's like I'm riding a bike backwards. Very helpful, Don. Appreciate the behind the scenes. Oh yeah, no problem. The key here is position, scale, and rotational data are kind of the only things that are going to live very easily across platforms. If you're someone who uses a lot of these up here in Cinema 4D, these are all the um, deformers. These do not work across platform. These will destroy whatever you've made in Cinema 4D. It won't work in um, other AR applications without, it just won't, it won't work. Not yet. It's just because uh, it's like a language, the language is too unique to, um, to Cinema 4D. Okay, so we got that null object there. We got this nice ambient spinning. Now what I'm going to do is add yet another null object. And this null object I'm going to use to create a tilt on the whole spinning apparatus. So I'm going to place this right in the bottom of the ring here and then parent that to it. And now this one is going to just control the tilt of our character throughout their lifetime. So now, and we can create a wobble. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I think I screwed up all the momentum by doing that. Let me uh, flip that back on. We might have to go a little bit lighter with that tilting thing, but essentially I could use that vector to tilt around. Whoa. I could use it to, to you know, tilt a little bit on the ring to create, you know, more secondary animation. Um, right now I put a, let me, let me just zero out, zero out the rotation, or is it at zero? I can't even tell anymore. Oh yeah, that is at zero. So if I gave it a slight rotation of like, let's see, three degrees on the Y tilt, it gives us a little bit of a wobble. Oh, we got a question from uh, Dews New says, no like in gravity. Cool, wobble is dream sequence. Wobble. Yeah, the wobble, I think I put the wobble on the wrong axis. Let me make sure this is staying flush with the floor. I'm gonna go to a side view of our character and make sure that it's flat on the bottom. Oh yeah, it is. I mean, it kind of jumps off a little bit off that grid. That's okay. Wow, that's kind of cool for its own purposes. But you see those green um, poles that connect the arms? Oh, battery died on the phone. <laughs> All right, I guess we're just streaming live on to uh, YouTube now. <laughs> um, the the green lines on the on the, on the character are your. Um, are the inverse kinematic relationship. That is the goal relationship. That's how it knows what to translate. All right, I'm happy with this. Like really happy with this. So I'm just gonna move it down to the floor plane of our entire scene. That's like our ground plane in Cinema 4D is that zero, zero, zero axis. And make sure that it's orbiting around that center and it looks like it is. And now we have a pretty complicated animation. The moment of truth is going to see, can this data work inside of Spark AR and Lens Studio? I haven't tried it yet. I haven't done a complicated IK rig like this. We've only tested just a hand movement. I'm really curious if this is going to translate in the other program. Before I do that, I'm going to add maybe a few more um, rotational curves to this, because if you display our polygons, you see how we can really see those angle breaks on the torus. It's a little thing. It's a little thing. But I might just go to the torus and add a couple more um, pipe segments. Oh wait, not pipe segments. Ring segments. 32 to be exact. That should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm guessing to use those Cinema 4D native tools, you'll have to bake everything. Yes, but then when you do that, you're right, you would have to bake it, but the problem is that doesn't work because it's too heavy. 
your, your AR file, like if you brought in an Alembic cache sequence, which is the very first thing I tried to do, um, you're going to be met with Fury from your AR application because it's just too much data for it to handle and it doesn't like that. And then, and then you'll, you'll have, you'll be on, you'll be a unhappy, unhappy day. I'm just changing the uh, knee. It looks like the, the leg was occluding through itself, so I just changed the uh, rotation there. Looks like I'm seeing one frame skip at the end. Do you see that? It's like skipping right the last frame. So I'm going to actually make this 63 frames instead so that we don't get a frame skip. There it goes. Now it's more seamless. All right. Let's hope that this works. I haven't brought in a character this complicated into, uh, I don't know, I hope this works. I'll feel really, it'll feel really embarrassing if this doesn't work. So uh, I'm gonna save it in case we made all mistakes. I'm gonna go to File, Export, choose gltf.glb, give that file format, looks good. Morph is PLA, there you go, hit OK. Um, we're gonna call this um, complicated. Uh, I can't spell. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that. You saw how poorly I spelled that. I'm going to leave it. I embrace my failures. Okay, so let's go back into Lens Studio or Spark AR, either one. Let's try Lens Studio first because that's what we started off with first before. And uh, so our previous character was just a single arm motion like that. Let's see what happens when we bring in a way more complicated animation. A lot more animation keyframes. I mean, you saw all of it, right? So we're going to go to import from files. I'm going to go to complicated spelled incorrectly. I'm going to import that into Lens Studio. Wait for all the textures to appear, then wait for the F, and then go into the prefab, that's the P, and drag the prefab as a child of the world object controller. Whoa, it worked. Wow. Yay, I'm going to scale it down. And then I'm going to take the, uh, what is this, red panda? No, this is a test one. I'll delete test one. And then I'll take red panda origin and set that origin to, or I'll set the world object origin to net zero. Um, and then we got a little elephant dancing next to me here. We got a second object. This is a little elephant act. I'm at a circus. Now I have a little baby elephant um, who is uh, cute. I'm just gonna maybe put that back here. Or no, then we can keep him big. We can do a big elephant back there if we put him behind me. And welcome to the circus. Uh, you might be noticing the ring is pink like this. That is Snapchat's, or that's Lens Studio's way of saying there's no data there. So I'm just gonna give it some data. Uh, we'll go into the meshes of our object, and there should be a torus in here somewhere now, under complicated. There's the torus, and then you see how there's no material. I'm going to click on choose material, and we're going to create a new uh, gold material. And I'll hit OK. And now I have a gold ring. And that, and that gold ring actually retains real, real, real world reflections from the environment. Um, the other thing that's cool is we can add some shadows. So I'm going to grab my body of my character, which is under the whole thing, complicated, under scenes, no, or null, none of these. I guess, oh, I guess I have to, oh, I have to expand all these. There's got to be a better way to do this. Actually, I don't know of a better way to do this. I'm going to right click and expand all of it. Where is the body? There it is. Oh, so that's just the torus. Oh, there it is. Okay, it's all those blue things. So I'm going to grab all those blue things. These are all the geometry in Lens Studio. And I'm going to go to the shadow mode and tell them to cast shadows. And now look at that. We get shadows of my body underneath it. And then we need to do the same thing to the torus. Grab it. Go to the shadow mode caster. Now we have shadows from everything. Uh, yeah, I can't spell either, says Dylan. Yeah, I'm right there with you. It's a struggle. Um, 
Lens Studio is, I would say it, it's similar, very similar to Spark AR. So I would say they're, they're similar in complexity, um, but both friendly to learn when compared to other AR applications like Unity and Unreal, where the learning curve is a bit steeper. Uh, but yeah, that is, that's a thing. Cool, so I'm proud of this. Look at that, we're, we're done. There you have it, folks. Friends, folks that are new to the, the page, my name's Don Allen. Uh, it's D-O-N-A-L-L-E-N-I-I-I. -I -I. That's where you can find me on Twitter, Instagram. And yeah, that's how you would go. For, I guess we, this was a way more advanced than just IK rigging. Uh, we went IK rigging and then full on character animation. Um, lots of different settings, but that's it. That is how we do it. Uh, I think that's a wrap. So um, I'm gonna make myself a little bit bigger here. Thank you so much for joining us in this live stream. Hopefully you learned a lot and can replay this for your own complicated characters and make some cool magical things happen. Take stuff from Cinema 4D, bring it into Lens Studio, bring it into Spark AR and tell your story uh, and you know, make your content. It's part of the metaverse future proofing. All right, thank you all so much for your time. I'm going to go get some food and call it a night. So I will talk to you later. All right, bye-bye. I don't know where the end button is. I'll find it um, and I'll see you over on other uh, applications. Oh, that's cool. The elephant moves with me in AR. It's interactive like that. That's cool. Okay. Bye-bye.